Welcome back to Plant-Based Kidney Health. I'm Michelle Krosmer, renal dietitian here with Dr. Hashmi, a nephrologist. And today we're talking about how to lower your blood pressure and what your blood pressure should be. Um, so Dr. Hashmi, can you start by defining like what is normal blood pressure, what's high blood pressure, and what ranges should someone with kidney disease be shooting for? That way they're not damaging their kidneys. You know, what's, what's so interesting about this question, Michelle, is when I started my career in medicine, we used to always say it was 140 or over as the top number, 90 or over as the bottom number was considered high. So bear with me as I tell you the stages you want to be aware of. The first thing you got to know, and the most important thing, is normal blood pressure is less than 120 as the top number and 80 as the bottom number. So it's less than 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. So that's really important. Then we get into this idea, well, what's considered to be next? Next is elevated. And elevated means that you're between 120 to 129 top number, less than 80 still on the bottom number. Now, what we used to consider long time ago as okay, so much data has come out that says, Hypertension stage one is now defined as a systolic blood pressure of 130 to essentially 139 and a diastolic blood pressure of 80 to 89. So if either one of those, so if you're greater than 130 or you're greater than 80, you have hypertension stage one. Hypertension stage two is more than 140 top number or more than 90 on the bottom number. This is the most important takeaway, and this is very different from doctors who might have been doing this for a long time. And as medicine changes, we need to adapt. So as you're thinking about, well, what's important? What's the ranges that you're aiming for? You're aiming to get into the normal range. And what about then, what about that in between the 120 and 130? Um, and between the, you know, if the goal is less than 120 over 80, mm -hmm. what about if someone's like 125 over 85 yeah. or, you know, or something, they're kind of in this in-between range. Well, so funny you should ask. That's where the criteria becomes on how you're going to treat high blood pressure. So let's get into then, how does somebody manage hypertension? So when we start to talk about this idea, the first thing you want to do is understand why doctors jump to medications. So when we talk about things like just giving somebody blood pressure pills, what we find is, is that if you compare it to like a sugar pill, the risk of things like heart failure goes down by as much as 50%. The risk for a stroke goes down by 30 to 40%. The risk for a heart attack goes down like 20 to 25%. So in other words, when we're talking about treating hypertension, it's very, very important. Now, here comes the question of when would you start treatment with medications versus you would just start with lifestyle. So when it comes to medications part, what you want to know is that if there's patients who are checking their blood pressure at home and they're running like 135 or more on the top number, 85 or more on the bottom number, those are patients we want to consider starting medications on. And this becomes really important is, is we want to have enough measures to look at that. But even if you do just an average number and you come to me and say, look, doc, you know, my average home blood pressures are running more than 130. My average home blood pressures on the bottom number are running more than 80. If either one of those is happening, then the question becomes is, who are the people that I really want to give meds to? So if they're just above 130 and they have things like kidney disease, they're older, 65 or over. They have heart disease or a stroke already. Those are the patients that I'm going to jump and start medications on. So once again, above 130 or above 80, you want to start medications. And when it comes to starting those medications, you have lots of options that we'll dive into. But between the 120 to 130 is where we want to focus on lifestyle changes. Those lifestyle changes are very simple. We call them the self principle, sleep seven to nine hours, move every single day, work on stress reduction, eat a predominantly plant-based diet, which means not the plant-based diets you get at the grocery stores with the food packaged labels, but actually whole foods, because that's what's going to be so important. 
But if you are at a position where you end up needing medications, the question becomes is, well, what's the right medication to use? So there's sort of, you know, four basic classes that we generally start with. First one is there are these diuretics. Specifically, they're called thiazide diuretics we jump on. The second class is calcium channel blockers. The third class is what we call angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. And the fourth is angiotensin receptor blockers. So those are your four main classes. But when patients get started, they're often confused. Well, you know, how come I got started on this drug and not that drug? The only time we become very specific is if you have an underlying condition that's important. For example, if you're spilling protein, you have chronic kidney disease by definition. So if you're spilling protein, my first line is going to be an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. So angiotensin conversing enzyme inhibitor or an ARB. If you're somebody, let's say, who has heart failure, well, the data on heart failure is, is I would want to use an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, or an aldosterone antagonist like spironolactone, or a plerinone, or a beta blocker. Those are what I would reach for. Or another example is, what if you have atrial fibrillation? Same thing. Atrial fibrillation, I want to be able to control the rhythm of the heart. So that's where I'm not going to jump to like an ACE or ARP, but I'm going to use a beta blocker. So in other words, when you talk to your doctor, and you, as the patient, are talking to your doctor. Your doctor is going to pick the medication based on what other medical conditions you have. That's going to decide it. But the bottom line is, is if you're above 130 and you're trying the lifestyle, it's not working, don't ignore it. Don't fall for the trap that there's still a lot of websites that still focus on the idea of if you're not over 140, you shouldn't treat it. That's not correct. You don't want to wait till it's so much worse that there's so much damage that's done. Because remember, blood pressure will stiffen up the vessels, will cause clotting and lead to all sorts of problems in the future. And the concept here is a little bit of prevention is way better than a ton of treatment down the line. All right, so Michelle, then let's dive into it a little bit. From a dietary perspective, what can you do to lower the pressure? Well, there's actually a diet, you know, that's made to help prevent and treat blood pressure called the DASH diet. Um, you know, it stands for dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Um, you know, again, the, it's a dietary pattern that includes foods rich in certain minerals and then uh, that can help with lowering blood pressure like potassium, magnesium, um, you know, it's high in fruits and veggies and whole grains and legumes. And usually this DASH diet and like Mediterranean type diet will include some like low fat dairy, fish, maybe some poultry, but overall they're very plant predominant, high fiber, heavy fruit and veggie um, uh, diets because those are shown to help lower blood pressure. The other thing is a low sodium diet. So some things will say less than 2,300 milligrams. Some things you might find less than 2,000. Uh, American Heart Association, more around 1,500 milligrams, but ultimately a low sodium diet, not the standard American diet of 3,500 plus milligrams of sodium a day. Um, a diet low in added sugar is important. And obviously I mentioned potassium. So potassium is a mineral that can help lower blood pressure. And a lot of times when we think of kidney disease, we hear potassium and then we're stressed and we're like, wait, I need to um, eat less potassium. So that it's important to always remember with kidney disease that potassium needs are individualized and it's not recommended to restrict potassium in your diet unless your blood levels indicate that, especially in early stages of kidney disease, because potassium is actually helping to be protective and lower blood pressure, which in turn prevents more damage to the kidneys. So, um, you know, usually we talk about potassium and we talk about sodium separately and it is important to think of them, you know, together and what, you know, that potassium sodium ratio. And so usually when, you know, the standard American diet is over 3,500 milligrams of sodium, but people are only eating about 2,500 to 3,000 milligrams of potassium, or really in even out, like outside of kidney disease, it's recommended that people have 2,000 milligrams of sodium a day and 4,700 milligrams of potassium a day. So generally it's recommended to have double the potassium as sodium and people literally eat the opposite of that and have like double the sodium that they have of potassium. And so 
translating that in, you know, for people with kidney disease, even if you had a potassium restriction and you needed to be on a low potassium diet, let's say 2,500 or 3,000 milligrams of potassium, then limiting your sodium and really making sure you're only getting 1,500 milligrams or less than 2,000 milligrams a day is a much better ratio and much better for helping control your blood pressure than if you were getting, you know, 2,500 milligrams of potassium and 35, 4,000 milligrams of sodium. Um, Another thing is lifestyle. Like Dr. Hashmi, you mentioned exercise, stress reduction, sleeping better, reducing alcohol intake. These are all things that um, affect your blood pressure. I think a lot of people, if you check your blood pressure regularly, you can tell, and I've had clients tell me this, that they don't sleep well the night before. The next morning, their blood pressure is way higher. If they're stressed at work, it's really hard getting their blood pressure under control. Um, And we do have a separate episode on stress and kidney health, and we give some kind of tips for helping with that. But prioritizing on top of, you know, diet and exercise, those are things that can impact your blood pressure a lot that we oftentimes don't think about. Oh, and then the other thing I was just going to dive into, because I know we have, uh, we get a lot of questions on this too, but then... Uh, supplements and and blood pressure and like, hey, what supplements can they take? That's great about food, but can I just take a supplement? And so one thing I would caution is if you like Google or you look for blood pressure supplement to lower or, you know, supplement to lower my blood pressure, there's specific like pill supplements that will pop up. And it's really a lot of these are like grape seed extracts and different things, but it's important to remember and look kind of at the fine print, Um, they're claiming a lower blood pressure, but then a lot of them will say um, to maintain an already healthy blood pressure or to maintain a healthy blood pressure. So they're not necessarily something that's lowering a high blood pressure. Um, They can be something that's just like helping maintain a a blood pressure. So supplements that are usually considered um, in lowering blood pressure, things like magnesium, omega-3s, garlic, beetroot powder, and CoQ10. And really the It's important to remember that all of these is that even if they can potentially lower your blood pressure, if you're taking antihypertensive medications, then you really need to monitor your blood pressure closely and talk with your doctor about supplements before you um, add them in. Because depending on the medication you're taking, then you don't want these huge drops in your blood pressure without adjusting your medication. So from a standpoint on magnesium, um, we've talked about that in other episodes, a lot of different types of magnesium um, that people can supplement with depending on what they're looking for. Um, And same thing, the amount will depend, but that is a possible supplement. Omega-3s, you have to be, remember, you know, you stop them before, you know, surgery because they can increase bleeding, but um, usually omega-3 supplements are something people can consider that can potentially help. Garlic is something where we want to be including it in our diet because um, garlic is something that you get the prebiotics in addition to the allicin, which is that sulfur compound that has the benefit of helping lower blood pressure. But if you are taking it in a pill form, then of course, um, you know, discuss that with your doctor. Usually you'll see anywhere like 300 to 1200 milligrams of that allicin um, compound in a supplement. CoQ10, people on dialysis with kidney disease and older age are more likely to be deficient. So this is a for a couple different reasons, and we have another episode on this as a popular supplement in the kidney disease world. But that's one that uh, is possibly effective. And then the one main one that I would say you want to be careful of, and I probably advise against for CKD is like the beetroot supplement because beets are high potassium, um, high in oxalates. And if you're having a powder form of it, it can be very concentrated and that might not be something that you want to have in your diet. Um, and then hibiscus tea. I mean, again, there's some, uh, potential for it to help lower mild hypertension, you know, a few glasses a day, but hibiscus tea and just on the topic of herbs in general is you have to be very careful and extra careful because some things you might see like, Oh, cat's claw, this lowers blood pressure, but then it's contraindicated in kidney disease. And so you have to be very careful with the herbal supplements. And if you're getting any type of tea, make sure it's like hibiscus tea. It's just hibiscus. It doesn't have anything else added to it. Or like you might hear basil and thyme and parsley are all great for lowering blood pressure. Include them in your diet. Eat, use them in your like seasoning and um, that, but don't be taking a supplement of that herb. Um, unless you really are discussing that with your doctor. And again, because you want to be closely monitoring your blood pressure. Uh, So Dr. Hashmi, then having said all that, let's say someone's like, okay, I want to lower my blood pressure. I'm going to exercise, sleep better, drink less alcohol, 
eat less salt, eat more plant foods, uh, you know, do all this stuff that we've been talking about. How does someone know when they should have their medications, their blood pressure medications adjusted or changed? Okay, so very, 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 very critical topic, and I can't stress this enough, is please, please do not stop your blood pressure medications on your own. If you do, it can actually lead to a fatal, meaning you can die from stopping your blood pressure medications abruptly. So once again, I can't stress this enough, do not, do not stop these medications without talking to your doctor. This is absolutely important. There are certain drugs, for example, there are short-acting beta blockers or short-acting alpha agonists, so propranolol being the beta blocker or um, clonidine being the alpha agonist. These can actually have an absolutely fatal withdrawal symptom. So you got to be really, really careful about this. Number two, you got to understand that for the majority of patients, Unfortunately, lifelong medications is what it ends up being. So a lot of patients end up being on blood pressure medications for the rest of their life. Now, that being the case, let's say you are somebody who's doing everything Michelle talks about. And the question is, when do you really consider it? So for us, when we start to consider patients, is, is we're looking for patients whose blood pressures are at target and that they don't have any history of essentially organ damage from high blood pressure. They don't have heart failure, they haven't had a stroke, they don't have kidney disease, etc. Because what we're worried about is people only know their blood pressure when they measure it. And the question becomes is what happens if it's high at night? What happens if it's high in the evening? You may not know. So if we jump the gun and end up sort of um, removing it too quickly, the challenge you're going to have is you could potentially be doing damage, you just don't know the damage because there's no symptoms to it. Now, on the other hand, if somebody's having like adverse events or their blood pressure is getting too low where they feel dizzy, then obviously those are straightforward that you want to lower blood pressure. But in terms of medications, just be very, very careful. There's a lot of people on, especially on the internet, who are stuck on this idea that they got to stop the medications. And, you know, we've always said, Food is the best way to do it. But a lot of medications come from plants. It's not like those are medications that are any different. So when you think about stopping, be very, very cautious because this could be absolutely deadly if you do it on your own immediately. Work with your doctor. That's what they're there for. And they will guide you through it, especially, you know, in my other practice as an obesity medicine specialist, I have so many patients that when they lose weight, their blood pressure medications are no longer needed and I taper them off. And on those cases, they're fine. They do great without them, but it's a very slow, methodical approach that also requires that after we've stopped their meds, they still report their blood pressures to me on a regular basis so we never lose sight of it. All right, guys, there you have it, our episode on hypertension. Thanks so much for checking us out. And as always, we'll see you guys next time. Bye Take guys. care.